This episode of Ticket Volume is brought to you by us, Invigate. Get service operations under control in no time. Get one free month of our software solution by going to try.invigate.com. Welcome to Ticket Volume Live. Today, I'm honored to have the director of IT support for Taylor Morrison, as well as an author, consultant, speaker, and trainer who has been the co-host of Keep the Lights On IT podcast. He's also got a history of serving as the state of Oregon CIO and many other roles. Welcome to Ticket Volume, news and information for improving IT experiences. I'm your host, Matt Barron, and each week I chat with different leaders on service management, technology, business, other nerd stuff, <laughs> and this live episode is no exception. Hey, while you're here, let us know what else you want to learn, see, and explore. We're here to grow together, so connect with us by leaving comments, connecting on your favorite platforms, or just DMing us directly. And if you're on the episode live with us, feel free to add questions to the chat. Uh, if you're on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitch, or Twitter, welcome. And feel free to put some questions in chat. We'll get to those in just a moment. For now, though, let's begin. Welcome to Ticket Volume Live, Greg Sanker. Hey. Hey, Thanks welcome. Later, uh, let me take this off the screen real quick. <laughs> well, now you can see us. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So thanks for coming today. Absolutely. We had you uh, on episode 20 of Ticket Volume, and we basically on that episode suggested that HR and IT stay very close together to deliver a better experience for employees. It was a very good, very good episode and great advice. But I wanted to get you back on because of this topic specifically, change management and change uh, enablement. So change has changed. Yeah, sure has. <laughs> and let's break it down. So what do you, when you think about change management, change enablement, what do you think the value to the business is? Well, all good things come through change. I mean, you know, any new feature add, any fixing of, of annoying, you know, bugs or bad things, any of that comes through implementing change. So we should probably be pretty good at that, right? Here's the challenge that we face is for so many organizations and, and, and right across the top says the cab is dead. Now what? Right. So I'm talking about change management. I'm not talking about cab. Uh, and, and, and that's an interesting distinction because for so many people, so many organizations, when you say change management, they think cab. Mm -hmm. They also, I, I used to do a word cloud. It's, it's for real, actually. Uh, I used to do a word cloud. I say change management and you say, and there was like, you know, painful root canal, uh, you know, death in the family. You know, it's just it's like, I'd rather do anything than come to your blasted cab mm -hmm. than, than do that, right? And it's like, it, 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 to some degree, I, I guess I kind of understand it. And to other degree, uh, it, it's, it's just kind of a natural uh, off, offshooting of, you know, get everybody together and talk about the minutia of everybody's job with the presumption that, you know, I've been working on this code you know, for six or eight hours and work some stuff out. And now some network engineer is going to ask me questions about my code. I was like, is that helpful? Well, maybe, but probably not. Right. So, so I, I, we've set the stage or, or we've invited people by putting this provocative cabs dead. Now what <laughs> out there? And, and, and I'm going to kind of the, the root of, is it cab or is it change management that's dead? There's mm -hmm. a, there's a good question. <laughs> and and watch, watch the phone light, you know, light up because everybody wants to come in on this topic. I don't know if you saw that article that I put on uh, our post that I put on LinkedIn uh, that, that said change management is not cap. Mm -hmm. And it generated a lot of activity. And I'm going to get to some of the, the comments that were made. Of course, I'll abstract the authors of those comments, uh, but it, it kind of got a slice of, of reality in there. Yeah, yeah, I love that. So the the value of change is really that that's how we're going to change the the things that we're providing, uh, whether they be services or products. But the revenue stream for the business uh, is going to be impacted by one of these changes, right? Yeah, it's and, and you know it, one thing that needs to be said, and and I and I realize that when you're talking about 
just about anything, I suppose, including politics. But when you're talking about change management, people are hearing what they, they understand those things to be. And so sometimes when I talk, I'm talking about something vastly, vastly different. So let me be explicit. Change management is about uh, in, enabling things to happen that produce business value or business results. So we've got to elevate out of the pliers and wires, as I like to say, the, the nits and the nips of, of all of those things that probably should have never uh, come to a cab or, or been reviewed more broadly. But these are significant things that uh, that actually have an impact on the business. We need to elevate to more of a governance and oversight. And hopefully I'll get to expand on that in a bit. Yeah, I love that. That, that makes so much sense. Let's have the value, but also make good decisions in the meantime. And um, in my experience with cabs, uh, typically have been at small organizations. When yeah. I was running a service desk, it's been like, you know, five or six people, each from a different team. And we get together and we're really, we're discussing the stuff that's going to be happening, whether it's a list or a print off of actual RFCs, uh, request for changes. Sorry, I'll stop. I'm not use acronyms. <laughs> uh, and really it was like, hey, is that going to fit in here? Is that going to fit in there? Are these going to conflict? Um, and the, the CIO would be in the room and they would say, you know, you can't do that during these times because this is when, you know, we're making money or this is when surgeries are happening or this is when patients' lives are on the line. Um, and that's, that's kind of been my experience with cabs. And then when I got into consulting, I saw a lot more rigor, a lot more of the enterprise. Mm -hmm. I saw it at, at places like Best Buy um, and Ameriprise and these large, large companies and it was vastly different. Um, yeah. and so talk about that. What is your experience with, with cabs and with change management at different size organizations? Uh, what does what good look like? So I, I've helped a couple of organizations in the, in the recent past uh, with their change management. And, the, and in those cases, both of them wanted a cab kind of, of, of operation. And, and so I helped them do just that. But, uh, you know, and I wrote about this in, in the book that I published in, in 2017 about change management. But the idea is don't, you know, you know uh, think globally and act locally. In other words, picture yourself having a highly mature change management practice, but take incremental steps towards that. So one of the things that in both of those organizations I did was if we just got the key stakeholders together and just talked about changes, we can avoid a lot of problems. I.e., yeah. you know, everybody knows that the service desk never knows what happens the day after. There's like oh, too bad nobody told us. Uh, but in this one organization, it was a government agency, and uh, they were unable to process tax returns. Now I told who uh, what the agency was uh, for about like six or eight hours because of a very very small change that was made. And I went to the senior guy that, you know, has a darkened area, a cubicle that's dark. And then you go in there and you need to do your incantations because he's just, you know, that level of, uh, of guru within the organization. And I asked him, if you had seen this change, would you have been able to predict this level of outage? And he said, absolutely. And so that's when we just started getting smart people together and saying, hey, these changes are coming. What about that? Now, if... If you continue the same thought of, hey, let's just get our people together and talk about all changes everywhere all the time, you automatically know that we, we have there's, there's a threshold where you cross where you can't do that at an enterprise level. You can't do that in a, in a modern organization. I mean, we used to we used to take six, you know, 12, 18 months to, to do product releases. Now we're releasing stuff, you know, hours, you know, in, in hours, you know, multiple hours a day. So you can't put a cab in there. You can't put an external review body. It just doesn't mm -hmm. work. So we have to think in terms of what's a highly mature uh, change capability look like versus where are we starting? Interesting, they, that one cab that I started at the state agency, the very first meeting looked like this. Yeah. Everybody sat around the table like, I don't even know Defensive. Why we're Interestingly, a few months down the road, people were coming early. There was a guy that baked bread and he brought bread and everybody's getting together. And at the doorway, there's people like, hey, next week I'm going to be bringing a change. I want to talk to you about it. It's like, hey, guys, we got to we got to get started here. Right. So all of a sudden we changed the culture around change. And I felt like, you know, it's like cab wasn't the end game, but it was a step towards a much more mature and empowered horizontally integrated organization. And that's where we're going. 
I love that. Bring yep. bread to get your changes approved. No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh but boy, fresh, that's fresh that's going to generate some question. Way. Oh yeah. my gosh, he was an expert baker too. By the way, he used to be a professional <laughs> baker. Now he's a, he's a coder. That's one way to butter up change requests. <laughs> oh. But I really like the uh, <laughs> I really like what you pointed out um, that there that there are these people that this tribal knowledge they really understand the services and architecture and infrastructure and what's going on in an organization and can provide some real perspective. So change management is meant to sort of leverage that knowledge, especially in the absence of a great CMDB or configuration. Or, or any sort of documentation about your infrastructure operations and services, because they could provide that that level of knowledge, uh, hopefully, in an ideal world, right? In an ideal world, absolutely. So one of the, the other realities um, that we need to face is that we, we talk about the, the risk that a change presents. And, and I've done some probing on this. I talk to a lot of people about change management, and I learn a lot. I've learned that the less I talk and the more I get them to talk, the more I learn. But one of the things that I hear about when we talk about evaluating changes for risk is that they're thinking risk that will be embarrassed or that IT will look bad or that we're going to have to spend the night in the data center fixing whatever thing you screwed up. Yeah. And it's like, that's not risk. That's inconvenience. But risk is risk to the organization, to the business. All risk is business risk. And here's the other reality is risk is intrinsically tied uh, to your organizational strategy. In fact, it's inappropriate to stay a uh, strategy that's informed by risk or risk uh, that is in pursuit. It is literally, th there should be one word uh, that, that says strategy risk. That's just one thing mm -hmm. because risk is an element of your strategy and change management then is an offshoot of how do we operationalize that appetite for risk or the operational need for risk or risk mitigation within the organization. And so when we're talking about change management, we're really talking about managing the organization in such a way that changes are implemented uh, in such a way as to provide the appropriate level of risk, managed risk within the organization. And that's intrinsically tied to governance. I don't get to decide as the change manager uh, or you know, somebody working in IT what the organization's uh, risk appetite is. That's not mine to say. And if I, if I thought I knew it, that could change hourly. It could change weekly depending on business conditions. So it has to be tied uh, to risk, uh, strategy risk at the, at the most senior level within the organization, but then operationalized. And that's, uh, that's a vastly different challenge. But, but important nonetheless, because this is really where change management exists and, and the, the function that it provides. I, I think about this as the value of change. Our, our friend Patty Blackstaff pointed out that the value of understanding those collisions and, and business cycles is that we can be more collaborative and cross-functional, which is totally right. And I think it's really important that we say that word again, that that governance word, because yeah. that really like I, I think you put it perfectly because so many people think governance is like, OK, stop the car from moving too fast. Yeah. Um, you know, put a governor on it. Um, yeah. But really, it's about meeting the, the goals of the business. In the car example, it's keeping your passengers safe. There's a reason there's a governor yeah. <laughs> on your U-Hauls and it's because you're not used to driving trucks and you've got yep. five tons it, of it, your household items behind you. It, it, it is, like in the case of the U-Haul, it is literally a, an upper, upper, yeah, I can't even say that. It's how your change risk strategy is, is, uh, is uh, operationalized. Yeah, it's like exactly. we're we're cutting off some some dangerous or high risk areas simply because we we can't tolerate that level of, of risk uh, within the organization. Now, I, I want to bring this one up because to me, it's so delicious. It's uh, like uh, I was reading in, in, in Forbes magazine, uh, the 10 biggest threats, risks and threats for business in 2023. I'm going to summarize the first three because they're interesting, but not to our point. And then I'm going to hit on the, on, the, on the fourth one of the 10. Recession, big concern for organizations. Interest rates, very closely related. Labor shortage, we all know that. All right, those are the big three. And then right behind that is rapidly changing market trends, i.e. we need to be more adaptive. I want to read you this. So this is uh, Isabella Sun, the CEO of Short Story. That's a 
San Francisco a retail. And she says the biggest risk companies have in 2023 is that market trends change much more rapidly than they used to. And being slow to react is detrimental. She goes on to say that this year is going to require companies to develop ultra fast reaction times to micro movements and to use data and technology to make rapid decisions. Organizations need to get maximum utility from the technology and data that they have to turbocharge reaction time. Now, try that with a cap, right? Yeah. It's like, whoa, whoa, everybody slow down. And the CEO is going, we got to run for our lives. We've got to execute. And she's talking about a level of precision and execution like we've never seen before. It, and, 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 you know, in, in, in their defense, the, the, the kind of the, 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 uh, uh, the, the flag leader in service management is ITIL. We know that. Mm -hmm. And in ITIL 4, we try to address it by talking about change enablement. Mm -hmm. But with all due respect to the authors of the uh, change enablement practice guide, because it was me, is we didn't actually address that because change enablement has more to do with the organization, governance, strategy, risk, and all those important elements. We need to stop talking about managing individual changes, but we're moving in that right direction. And I think that's the important piece because change management is not about slowing down uh, long enough to make sure it is about accelerating up to meet the velocity that we need. Stuart Rance told me long, long, long ago that is we must match the rate of speed required by our organization, not exceed it and not lag it, right? So <laughs> there's a caveat there. We need to understand what it is first and foremost, and then we need to engineer practices that match that, that rate of speed. And I'm telling you that CAB cannot cannot possibly match the rate of speed. So that brings us to what do we do? Yes, well done, Greg. This goes all the way back to episode one of Ticket Volume when um, Rob England was on. He talked about the VUCA world where there's volatility, yep. uncertainty, um, complexity, and ambiguity. And a fast change management response to that VUCA world is how you create velocity. As Mark Smalley pointed out in episode 25, velocity is about speed and direction. So we're yep. meeting that governance need, but we're able to do it at pace. And I really, I'm really glad that you brought up ITIL4 because part of what I love about ITIL4 is that they're less prescriptive, uh, yep. especially, especially in this specific area. Uh, because we saw this in the DevOps movement of the last yeah. 10 years. If we're going to be building and operating something together, we need to build and operate how we build and operate that thing together. And yeah. so it's, it, it's, it comes down to partnering with the individuals that manage these services to build a governance framework that fits. Perfect. Have you, I, I won't ask you, but if, if anybody's ever read Accelerate, you know, the, the uh, Dr. Fosgren and a whole bunch of authors, um, they specifically, and that's why I, I, I quote this often, they specifically address the concept of change management and then un went on to criticize CAB. Yeah. They've mixed the two up, which they all know better. But here's what Gene Kim had to say. He said, in regulated industries, segregation of duties is often required either explicitly in the wording of the regulation for like, for instance, PCI DSS, or by auditors. However, implementing this control does not require the use of CAB or a separate operations team, i.e. an independent body to review what's being done. He said there are other mechanisms that can effectively be used to satisfy both the letter and the spirit of the control. He's absolutely right. We don't have to achieve that, but we do have to achieve it. And that's the point there is when when you're working with PCI DSS or HIPAA or Sorbane-Oxley or any of those other uh, control frameworks, uh, regulatory frameworks, you have to meet those. And only in version five of, of NIST 853 did they stop saying who should do certain things. They just said these things need to be done. And that's a massive opening to it can be done by anyone. And I talk about the, the change management happens in the value streams, not in some separate independent uh, sort of source. And did you know that there's over 14 control families associated with managing what they call configuration uh, management uh, 
in the NIST 853, there's massive requirements. And one of the folks that commented on my post on LinkedIn uh, said, you know, basically I said change management is not cab. And that person said, uh, uh, that's that's something I'm, I'm, I'm summarizing because I don't want to uh, call them out just directly, but it, something along the lines of, well, if that's true, could you get the word to PricewaterhouseCoopers and our internal <laughs> auditors that demand notes from the cab so that we can demonstrate that we've met the requirement? And that's the reality that many people face in organizations is you have to be able to demonstrate and cab is an incredibly convenient way. Did it go to cab? Is a big old check mark, you know, almost with a crayon held overhand. Yes, it went to cab. Was value added at the cab? I don't know. It doesn't matter. We're talking about compliance. So here's the thing. We need to stop looking at each and every, you know, like the inspector looking through the magnifying glass. And we need to start looking at change as a flow. We need to look at it as a, how do we engineer, I'm going to Dr. Deming now, how do we engineer quality into the process so that the things that come out the end are at the level of quality that we desire? That's the focus of change management. In fact, Jess Humble said on stage at DevOps Enterprise uh, Summit in, in San Francisco, it's now you know 2018, so it's a, a little bit old, but he said, we believe that uh, change management should be more of an oversight and governance role. And I yelled at the YouTube where I was watching it. Yes, this is what I've been saying. It's not kill the cab. It's not uh, destroy the cab. It's let's make change management meet the needs. And when you're talking about the velocity of and, and quantity of changes, cab ain't it. But it's not that there's not a role for it. And that's the difference. Well put, Greg. You nailed it, my man. It, we... We knew that we needed faster change. We've known that since the beginning of time, I believe. Yes. Um, and and um, capturing the demand, the value, the risks, the plan, all of that in the change, still important, right? Like we need to know why we're doing this, how much we're spending, what value it's going to bring us, what risk it brings, and and how how the hell to turn it around when when we, when it goes wrong. Um, and I think in, involving and including those things in the change management process um, can, can be great. The more you automate, the better. And um, I really like the idea of CAB, instead of talking about individual requests for change, looking at it from an oversight of the process. Yes. How, how is our CICD pipeline actually protecting itself? Yeah. How, how, are we, how are we enabling the speed and velocity of change so that yep. we're not getting in the way and continuing to, to build. It's almost like voice of the customer and the customer are the people putting in the changes. Oh my gosh, look at that quote from Roy. <laughs> <laughs> Going really, really fast only matters if your car isn't smacked into the wall. And that's exactly right. Yeah. It's like delivering changes at, you know, at, yeah, at 500 a minute only helps if it doesn't bring your, your business to its knees. Yes. Remember when Facebook was down? Uh, I'm, I'm going all the way back to uh, October of 21. And it was a minor, minor, minor issue. Uh, they, they wrote an engineering article on it. It was, it, was, it was a command that was issued during, quote unquote, routine maintenance. I.e., yes. It was a change. And it brought down the whole suite of prod products for Facebook at the time mm -hmm. uh, for it was depending on who you talk to is either four or six hours. Total dead K.O. It was down, right? And you think, wow, that's that's kind of bad. That's that's not good. But the fact of the matter is, on further examination, they had controls in place. There was specific uh, technology pieces in place to analyze the command and to avoid exactly what happened. So did they fail or did they learn? Mm. They learned because they immediately went back to work and updated their, their risk profiles or the risk register and said, okay, now that we know that this can happen, they went to work on it. They're expert at this. But it's still a lot, depending on who you, you ask, I've, I've looked at multiple articles and they've been upgraded over time, but somewhere between 65 and $99 million of lost revenue during that outage. And Zuckerberg himself, our good friend Zuckerberg, lost a personal wealth of 5.9 
billion with a B billion dollars of valuation in the company that he, that he started, right? So this is not about pliers and wires or, oh boy, you should have taken that to the cab. This is about business risk. Mm -hmm. And so change management or taking that change to a cab absolutely could not have helped it. But what they did with the, we had, we understood what our risks were. We put controls in place. We learned something about them, something new about them. And we put additional controls in place. That's change management. That's exactly what it is. I would not come in there and say, you know, you guys really need to have a cab for these kind of changes because, you you know, $99 million of lost revenue. That's kind of big, right? Yeah. Um, so it's we have to change our mindset around what change management actually is. And I wish there was another term. Change enablement isn't it. But I, 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 it, it really is an extension of organizational risk. It really is. Yeah. Yeah, there isn't a better name for it. I, I think that would be a good challenge. Like, let's find a good name for it because... You, well, it's it's got lots of code names. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, some that we can say on the air, and some that we probably oughtn't to. <laughs> yeah, but that is. I mean, you can kind of see why auditors care about it, why shareholders might care about it, especially if they're if they've been in IT for any short amount of time. Yeah, if digital services is your primary revenue stream man, change management is a huge deal. You, you yeah. might not see this in a manufacturing organization where there's, well, there's less velocity overall in the technology yeah. space. Um, but wow, you can see the impact. I mean, you said B, billions of dollars. Yeah, yeah, this is a big deal. So here's the other aspect that I was hoping that we'd get to. So I'm going to insert, and I know we're going to turn to questions here pretty quick. Yep. Uh, and that's where I get scared because there, there's people on the phone that are really, really smart and yep. we'll have so a great time. In the chat. Try to stump Greg. <laughs> put, him, put him in here. Make me look dumb. It'll be fun. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that modern organizations do, and you hear thought leadership talk about this all, this, uh, uh, all the time, and that is we need to be learning organizations. We need to craft safe to fail and empower people to take calculated risks. So if the role of change management or the goal, I should say, of change management is zero uh, uh, failed changes or zero bad consequences, where's the learning? Oh, man. A, a capability that is sworn duty in life is to make sure that you never, ever, ever fail. If that is at odds with or antithetical to a learning organization that does allow things to fail because that's where we learn, like Facebook did in that example there. So one of the roles of change management need to be, how do we put the guardrails in place? When we say safe to fail, we don't talk about that very much. We talk about, hey, people should be allowed to make mistakes and learn. Mm -hmm. But safe to fail is an engineered thing. We engineer environments, both the technology, how it's managed, how it's deployed in such a way that any, we believe, that any failure is not going to be catastrophic. It will be controlled and limited. And so our learning will be optimized while our you know, degradation of the business value created will be minimized. And this is critically important. And I believe that change management is part of that safe to fail uh, equation. We can't allow ourselves to be fighting an organization that wants to, desperately to learn. Yeah, I think that's, Maybe that actually is the other name, right? Learning from change, uh, engineered to learn. Uh, yeah. and, and you see this, I, I, I've been doing research on this because I'm curious about it. You saw it, I was looking for change yeah. people. <laughs> yeah, I know. What I was looking for was this, uh, you know, how are DevOps people, uh, um, yep. are, how, how are they meeting this governance? How are they meeting this, this stop? And what are they doing to engineer around this? And I yeah. found lots of great articles, people doing um, GitHub actions to control their CI CD pipeline. And um, I saw people, you know, really amping up the velocity on standard changes, yeah. creating more and more and more and more of those standard changes and the cab taking the time to build those standard changes. Yeah. Yeah. And you can kind of see how uh, even in the old days, we did a lot of this in dev, in test, and in prod, <laughs> where we would we would learn in those lower environments and then yep. apply that learning to the, the upper environments, lower, upper, whatever. So 
you just you just hit on something that I think is 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 really um, critically important. You know, because the the standard answer from your DevOps folks, and and we have some here on the on the on the call today, but the standard answer is: look, nothing gets into production that doesn't go through the pipeline. The only way it gets into prod is it goes through the automated testing, the stage gates to to get it out the door. So there is no way that you can add any value. And as a change management professional, I'm standing back and going, perfect. Now I can tell PricewaterhouseCoopers, this is where those controls in this pipeline are enabled. However, on this pipeline over here, it's a little bit different mm -hmm. and I have to care. And so when your pipeline folks are focused only on their thing, they don't really, outside of their, have the interest of the organization in mind, they don't really care how it applies to somebody else. They just know that you're standing in my way of delivering at velocity. Yeah. So change management then take, is, takes a step back and says, hey, let's work with the various pipelines and let's map out where they're implementing those controls so that we can both demonstrate and assure that the organizations change outcome expectations. That's my phrase. And I'm going to make sure it gets it in the lexicon if it's the last thing I do is that's how an organization that is governed says these are the things that we want with regard to change. It's up to you guys to figure out how that's done in the various pipelines. And it's up to change management then to work with those pipelines and say, okay, where is this being done? Got it. Now we can say to the PricewaterhouseCoopers, since we picked on them, you know, these are where those, those control objectives are being met within the pipeline. Awesome. Okay. We have beat this topic to death. I love it. Um, good shout out for your book. Uh, what is the title, by the way? Uh, IT, it would be terrible if I couldn't remember, right? <laughs> IT Change Management, a Practitioner's Guide. And for those of you that have looked for it, Amazon is in the process of restocking. It's been reprinted, so please be patient or go to the publisher TSO. I love it. So we'll take a question now. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll take a question now. Should a cab of sorts assume the role of determining which types of change are which, which need a, a further oversight, et cetera? from our friend Roy Atkinson. Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. There's more to that question than just the, the few words. He's the master of uh, the tip of the iceberg. So the answer is, is yes, but they need to do so within uh, the confines of, uh, or, uh, within the context of, of the value stream itself. The value stream itself should be dynamic and adaptive, but that it uh, automatically, if you will, quote unquote, uh, identifies what, what level uh, of risk does this particular change uh, uh, present to the organization? And, and then we run it through an adaptive um, process. One of the things, uh, and you'll love this, one of the things that is emerging, though very, very quietly, is there are organizations, and I talked to the CEO of one of them, are working on actively mining any related data from your organization so that they can make real-time predictions on what the risk level of any given change is so that you can act dynamically. It's like this risk, this change has this level of risk in the operate. It's Let's call it artificial intelligence, but let's not get into that. Let's just say we're being really smart yeah. because humans are, you know, those subject matter experts that, you know, the, the, that know what happened in the organization, there's a limit to that. But AI doesn't have that limit. It can look at massive amounts of data and say, here's the circumstances around this particular change that caused problems. And this change here is presenting similarly. I think we should take a closer look at it. Uh, so that's where we're going as an industry is we're, we're getting the, because we're, we're flowing at such a high velocity that, you know, Greg Sanker can't, you know, stop and say, hmm, I don't know. This one kind of concerns me. I think, you know, party's over by that time. Mm -hmm. so, we, so we have to use modern tools to match modern velocity. Yes. Well done. Modern tools to match modern velocity. I also think like um, it, you kind of know what you know and you know what you don't know about yep. a service. The yep. more you know and the more information you have about those services, the, the better you can be informed about what kind of changes have to go through it. And um, and what sort of rigor goes around it? Let's so, take a, so, let's take another one. So while you what? Okay, there you go. Go ahead. When speaking of impact, I've seen it implemented as either a high, medium, low rating, or um, a description of what the end user experiencing might have like. Like what is the downtime and after the change? Can you elaborate more on the best way to evaluate impact for a change? See, this Good is one. 
This is, but thanks, Brian. That's a really tough one. And the answer is, uh, I don't have a good answer for you. Now, <laughs> here's, here's, here's the right answer. And I don't mean to be flip, but is uh, it, it, the user experience is important, but our ability to articulate what is the, the positive and negative impact on business value being delivered, i.e., yeah. You know, if 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 a few people are are being negatively impacted, you know, slowing down their work twenty percent, we we can kind of calculate to some degree. We can calculate what that looks like. If the entire organization can't close their general ledger at, at, at month end, we can calculate that. I mean, we all know this. Brian knew that when he asked the question. That's not what he's asking. Um, but if if you can, in a more real time basis, assess it from a a, a value impact uh, standpoint, you know, Kobit go, talks about value realization. It's like change changes should yield value. Mm -hmm. And we make those changes because we believe that they're going to add value. In some cases, we're maintaining value, you know, sustaining changes and things like that. But the, the answer to the question is we have to get away from you know, impact. And, and, and I'm even concerned to some extent that that we're we're using experience as as, as a yardstick. It, it absolutely has to be. So don't hear me wrong. But experience itself doesn't equate directly uh, to the value that you delivered. Yeah. In fact, in, in, in a lot of organizations, we understand the experience. Uh, in fact, my wife works for an organization that is moving exceedingly fast. And she comes home and goes, you'll not believe the stupid, god-awful system they implemented. And she'll explain it. And it's like, wow, if I were a change manager from 20 years ago, I would have denied that change. I said, but watch this. In three weeks... I said they will be materially better. And in six weeks, it will be at the level that you would think it should have been three weeks ago. And mm -hmm. sure enough, boom, boom, right on target, right? So the user impact or the user experience during that initial rollout was considered less of an impact on the value than having that capability in place, even though it's handicapped, you know, so minimum viable and things like that. And so if you look at change management strictly from a let's limit negative impact and not from a what's the value of that negative impact versus what's the value of the outcome that we're achieving, then we're starting to have a business value uh, question that doesn't happen in a cab, by the way. That has to happen through a governance process. Yes, at a higher level. What is the risk we're taking? Because we need to know if it's worth it. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think back to the stories that you said at the beginning, you know, Facebook ran this script, they lost millions of dollars. What if we put that on the change form? What if we understand that about the yeah. service? If this change goes awry, we're looking at a $50 million loss or, you know, yeah. per minute, we lose $1.2 million per minute. And if it's down for 50 minutes, then we're at 50 mil. So I, I, I was called in to help a major box retailer with their change management. And I, while I was there on their campus, a, a change was implemented that I, I'm going to shorten it. And I don't want to point any fingers, but a, a change was implemented that brought down their ability to process credit cards at point of sale across the entire North American uh, uh, fleet of stores. Right. Major, major impact. And I said, since I was there and I'm the change management consultant and the CIO was livid beyond all measure, I said, let's go look at the change record that produced that. And it was rated as low risk, low impact, new code, won't impact anything. And I said, as we're looking at this on the screen, I said, anybody have any feelings about that? <laughs> Something's wrong here. I said, did the business owner who was responsible for that revenue stream, did they know? that their ability to book revenue was at peril with this change. Did they know that? And if they did, would they have approved this change? And, and I wasn't suggesting that the answer should be no, but it's, this is a business risk. This is not an IT risk. This is not a damage to the CIO's reputation or ego. This is business risk. Mm -hmm. Just like the Facebook thing is there had an impact on the business. And that's why we have to shift our focus onto those more strategic things. I love it. Well answered. Good job, Greg. Let's take another question. How to effectively, how do we manage the risk while increasing velocity, implementing changes on a large infrastructure, large systems uh, without having a uh, commitment? Comite? Que es comite en español? Yeah, sorry. But <laughs> what, what, I'm, what I'm getting out of the question uh, is that we're making 
small changes towards this large eventuality. So, so how do we manage the risk of that? And what, what I, I will try to uh, answer that, but I'll also zoom back and say, we have a, a different challenge increasingly facing us. It's like, okay, we're going to move our ERP from this internally developed, you know, a proprietary system to the cloud. And we're going to do it on a weekend, right? So we're doing massive changes on a knife edge transition. And for those kinds of things, there better be a tremendous amount of planning and mapping out and risk analysis and risk uh, assessment and mitigation strategies. And that looks an awful lot like a cab or some body that gets together and says, hey, do, have we addressed all the, the risks? So then it starts looking like an, an effective uh, project uh, management office effectively managing risk of projects. And it's like, good, that's perfect. That's a perfect place to do it. Just don't call it a cab. It isn't a cab. It's just the organization managing business risk. But in this case, we're really talking about we want to move very, very quickly. And so phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. And so one of the things that we we uh, regularly recommend, and, and, and this is this is kind of older, but it hasn't been widely done, is present the overall project plan or the overall plan. This is what we're doing. This is why it's important. This is what the business uh, points of inflection are. And here's the individual phases. And here's the things that we think are going to be in there. And what we're going to do is we're going to let people know, okay, phase one implementation is going to happen this weekend. Here's the things that are included. Just let, let everybody know. And so now you're managing the big change while acknowledging that there's going to be incremental changes along the way, which may or may not be exactly what you're asking about. But it's one of the tools that's so seldom used. We either wait and say, okay, the big change is coming. Are we all go here? Which has no value. Right. Uh, right. Because you're not actually assessing risk. You're just saying, uh, you know, I used to do this. I, I used to look at my most senior people in cab and I would say, are you nervous? <laughs> and I would usually get the, I'm pretty confident. It's like, okay, I think we're good to go. Or if he goes, ah, this could be a really long weekend. I was like, okay, is there anything we can do about that? Right. So, you know, let your subject matter experts have uh, inform you. But when you kind of take a look at the, at the big picture and then zoom in and say, and this is how this is going to be broken up, but there's a broader context that's already been established. Then we don't have to ask dumb questions like, well, what are we trying to achieve here? This is part of the blah, blah, blah. We've already talked about that. This is one of the, of the many phases that we're going to do uh, in getting there. Now, the, the piece that always makes people wiki is we don't know what's going to be included. That's what we figure out along the path. Perfect. We still understand what the roadmap is. We understand what the game plan is. I like it. It's sort of like, um, I'm going to put some words in your mouth, but it kind of sounds like the cab has a branding problem. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> we maybe don't call it cab anymore, right? Just yeah. call it work. We're yeah. just working. And, and whether the PMO is pulling the triggers and saying yeah. yes, and they have the authority or some other, you know, technical guru advisory board thing exists, whatever it is, you still need to do it. It's just a matter of, do you do it beforehand, before the changes are coming through um, yeah. and get out of the way of velocity, really? Yeah, and that's where if you allow, uh, you know, we talk about um, self-organizing uh, work teams. It's like, uh, I know change managers that, yeah, we call them stakeholder calls. Absolutely. It's like, who cares about this and what are their concerns? Are they good? Have we addressed their concerns? And, and stakeholders usually implies beyond the walls of IT into the business. Uh, I, I'm aware of this is, this is kind of age old now, uh, but a change that was denied because I had a 40% chance of failure and IT is like, no way, no how. The business who happened to be sitting at the table said, hang on, hang on, hang on. 40% chance of failure means 60% chance of success. We think that that has high business value and we're willing to take the risk because the business window is so important to us. It's like, so that was a stakeholder call that said, we get it, we get it. We understand that bad things can happen, but in the balance, the business value is actually driving that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, smaller, more controlled change. Some good comments uh, on the thread here. So I do want to point out specifically that if you're enjoying this conversation and you like having these discussions with experts, make sure you join us April 14th while we talk about service and support leadership.
But that's not all for today. We've still got one more question. Oh, so boy. let's see what else we got. What role could predictive analytics play in assessing the potential risk to business of a change or a group of changes? Yeah. Good question, Roy. Yeah. And you know, if, you've, if you watch uh, Roy's um, his public um, presence, he's talking a lot about artificial intelligence. At the same time, the poor guy is talking about uh, customer and employee experience. It's like, what a misguided com combination of things, right? Wrong. It's like they're one and the same. So mm -hmm. the, the, the answer is, it's actually a really good question. And, and, and that is, as we can up our game and understanding what the value, you know, I answered the question and I did not mean to be flipped, but it's like, you know, if, if a user is going to have a poor experience and I said, no, 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 focus on value because we don't know what the one you I'm like, well, that's not very practical, Greg. And, and, and you're right in that criticism. But where I'm going is, the tools that we can bring to bear on this elevate our game by orders of magnitude, multiple yes. orders of magnitude. We can assess what the business value impact is going to be. And that's how we can have an adaptive change capability that actually is in alignment with the governed risk uh, appetite for mm -hmm. the organization. See, all of these things, it's like we're, we're still operating with a certain limitation, I'm going to tell a very uh, uh, quick story. Uh, Bill Fosbury invented the Fosbury flop, which every high jumper uses now. No, there's no one that doesn't use the Fosbury flop. They used to jump over, you know, scissor jump and, and, and standing erect. But along comes the invention of a, a, a padded. It used to be a pit of, of sawdust and landing on your back on a pit of sawdust would be very painful. But for, for, for logistical sakes, they created these padded things. And he goes, hey, I can fall on that. And in so doing. And it, it was cha challenged at the 1968 Olympics. And, and I think it was in Mexico. You can read all about this. Just Google it. But Bill Fosbury went to college about 12 miles over here. Right. So and his coach was one of the Oregon State University coaches. And what happened was he went to the Olympics. He won the Olympics. There was a big hub of about, did he violate the rules? And the answer was, no, he didn't. He just fundamentally invented a different way that is way more effective in achieving the outcome, which is clearing the bar, as opposed to doing it the way we were used to doing. So here's where I'm going with that. With these modern techniques, with the modern tools, artificial intelligence, uh, dynamic and adaptive uh, pipelines and whatnot, is if we're still thinking that change is about income, or, you know, something that comes in, we look at it and then we let it on down the line, is that is just diametrically opposed to what we're trying to do. So we have to kind of, uh, of sh you know, shake our head really hard and go, wow, something's changed here. Now we're doing the Fosbury flop with change management. We're not doing what we used to do, but we haven't gotten there yet. And that's, and I wrote about this in the, in the book that I made mention of is if we stay tied to cab, 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 we will never get there. We've mm -hmm. got to change our mindset. We need to reinvent how we think about change, what the role of change is, and how do we work with those within the organization. It's not command and control. It's not mother may I. It's not inspect every. And it's a whole different thing. So what Roy is really driving at is the game has changed and we just haven't yet fully implemented that. And that's the challenge that's ahead of us. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you for asking that question, Roy. It is a good one. And I built this, um, I built this at one organization where we we had a ton of information about the services. We had the service map completely filled out, and you could actually put in a change on one CI and it would walk up the chain all yep. the way to the top yep. and say, Oh, this is for uh payroll. And then that payroll person gets alerted, Absolutely. hey, they're gonna do this thing on this system. So make sure your hair isn't on fire on Friday or Thursday or whenever we do it. Uh, and that gave us a lot of information. So we were able to kind of use uh, computer logic, basically, to say, you know, should this change happen? Should it not? Yeah. What is the risk? Is it low? Is it high? And um, it, in regards to, and that was helpful. And in regards to Roy's question specifically, I really love the idea of using some, some sort of uh, data analytics to show me past performance of change 
who submitted this RFC and how well did their last RFC go, especially on this system or service, because we're going to be able to say, you know, from a people aspect, whether we can trust this RFC or not. <laughs> right. And, and and you also get the ability to, I mean, like, you know, we used to talk about big data. That used to be the cool word to say, right? Yep. But if you think about it, we can map weather, we can map political uh, cycles, we can map uh, you know, the economy, we can map a lot of factors into the situations around which that past data. So it's not just past data of this request or this system, but it includes that. But it also includes a lot of other parameters that might impact uh, what's going on and it might change uh, the risk level. Uh, like, like, like you said, if you, if, you, uh, if you bring down your patient management system uh, while somebody's in emergency surgery, I mean, that's the definition of bad, I think, right? So that's a bad outcome, right? So we know not to do that, but that's pretty easy not to do. Mm -hmm. When those things happen, you know, what we call these black swan events where this, 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 and this just happened to happen all at the same time and it made this catastrophic thing coming, humans are really not suited to anticipating those kinds of things. Oh, man. But, but strong data analytics and AI is much more suited. I won't say it's a able to, but it's much more suited to assess the likelihood of that happening. I mean, that's the, that's what these weather models are. I mean, Texas last night took a massive hit of tornadoes. And I texted my friend down there. And I said, are you surviving? Yeah, we're doing OK. But live on television, it's like, hey, we went and reported. And then 10 minutes later, we came back. And now the reporter's in front of rubble because stuff went down. Right. Mm -hmm. But those models that we use to attract so many conditions, wind and weather and or not weather, but temperatures and all of these things that help us to build these models. And then we layer multiple models. So we say, hey, the average of the models is saying this, so we're, we're operating on this. That's exactly what they're doing. It's not like somebody sitting in a news center going, wow, I think this is gonna be a bad one because yeah. I've been around for lots and lots of years. Yeah, yeah. And what a good metaphor. Weather. That's such a good metaphor. Well done, Greg. Greg, I wanna thank you so much for your time. To the audience, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for being on Ticket Volume. Well, thanks for having me. This is fun. I would, <laughs> I would do it again. And I already see that I got a couple of LinkedIn requests. So please feel free to connect. Please feel free to disagree with me because to move this industry forward, that's exactly what we have to have these conversations. Thanks, Matt, for facilitating it. Thank you, Greg, for being here. And thank you to our audience. Thank you for listening. Our next episode, uh, our next live episode will be April 14th with Tony North talking about leading service and support teams. We're going to discuss hiring, training, rewards, and what it takes to lead a service desk team. Register today at invigate.com slash ticket dash volume. And We've got a bunch of episodes out there. We've got almost 50 episodes and more coming. So subscribe to receive alerts when new episodes are published. And just like I mentioned at the beginning, leave us feedback, reviews, or DM us if you have something that you want us to focus on, something you want to learn, or a question that is perplexing you. Because this podcast is brought to you by Invigate, the all-in-one IT service and asset management system that helps organizations with world-class IT support. If you're looking for a solution to build your help desk without the headaches of year-long implementations, you will love Invigate. In fact, IT teams from NASA, Toyota, and McDonald's use Invigate to manage requests, automate workflows, and centralize inventory data so that they can focus on delivering better service. Because remember, Good service is good business.